No more poor people. Everybody made the same amount of money. Everybody was equal. Nobody received more pay than anyone else. I mean, again, everybody made the same amount of money. How did this come about? Oh, it came about peacefully. When people decided that, hey, enough of this. So, uh, what did they do? Persons who had jobs that everybody liked had to work longer hours. The person who had a job like garbage, like the people didn't want, they got the same pay, but they worked fewer hours. So uh, the bonus there was, if you worked at undesirable jobs, you got more time off. If you worked at the more desirable jobs, you had to work more hours. Well, well nobody got more than others. And if somebody accidentally inherited, like had two or three ancestors die at once, he, inherited, his, his, he had to get rid of it fast because he'd be taxed too heavily. So nobody could have anything more than anyone else. So, oh, this was a socialist utopia. Then. He found a way to come back, and he came back to the present, the 1880s, and found that nobody would listen to him, and nobody would believe him. But the book caught fire, and a lot of people said, hey, let's try this. Let's practice this. Let's all try to make all pay equal. With all respect to them, they did not know better. Now, socialism, folk promises... that you can live any old way you want to and never have to take the consequences for it. Again, I wish I had some soap here. I'd wash out my mouth. Socialism promises you can make as bad a judgments as you want to about your finances and live as crummy a life as you want to and you're going to live equal to everybody else who makes wise decisions. Now, here's the bad news, really bad. I was listening to a radio station on the way in here this morning. I mean, it, it took me an hour and a half to get here. And they told how that this country is fast heading towards socialism. Folk, I wish you'd look at Venezuela. If you were living in Venezuela today, you would not be going to school. Why? The land of Venezuela is experiencing a nationwide power blackout. No power. And people who have relatives who are staying in hospitals are concerned. I mean, my relative needs the electricity in order to uh, keep his life support going. There's no electricity to be had. Now, I had a person this morning ask, well, what about Finland? Fortunately for me, I had a student who was from Finland a few years ago. And I've had other students who were from neighboring Sweden. You might have heard of socialism, that Finland is a socialistic utopia. There's another side to that. Other persons say that Finland and Sweden are both about to go under. Sweden, particularly, it's looked on as being a classic example of how wonderful socialism is. Today, Sweden is the rape capital of the world. If you don't believe it, look it up. And it's not the Swedish men but the Swedish men are not protecting the women. It's these foreigners whom they've allowed in who contribute absolutely nothing but their leeches. They expect to be fed, clothed, and housed and receive free medical care while they contribute absolutely nothing. Does any of you know what I'm talking about? Have any of you heard this from other sources? If not, you need to hear it. Socialism killed some 20 million people in Russia in the 1930s during a time of bountiful harvest and killed 25 million people in China when the Chinese were having a bountiful harvest in the 1950s above, when I was a kid. Well, how did that happen? Did my heart? Simply, the people turned in all the produce to the central government and the central government did not have the means to properly distribute it. And a lot of people were left out, even though there, were plenty, there was plenty of food, simply because the central government, the people there, were too busy to make sure the food got to all the places where it needed to go. Now today, computers might help, but then even with computers, you need the trucks and the truck drivers to carry it to where it's needed. Computers don't carry food. Um, 
All right. What does that do? The socialist movement was gaining a lot of headway back then. Eugene Debs believed that everybody should receive equal pay and that your corporation owners should be paid the same as your janitor in your factories. Extreme. Eugene Debs was instrumental in getting a lot of strikes going, stirring up a lot of trouble, and even getting a lot of people killed. He spent quite a bit of time in prison. He was in prison more than once. He ran for president on a socialist ticket. The socialist actually had a party at that time called the Socialist Party. They would get about 3% of the vote every time. Eugene Debs got a million votes for every presidential election from 1920, 1916, 1912, 1908. From about 1900 to 1920, he ran five times and polled more than a million votes for some 3% of the electorate. He never got an electoral vote, but he would run for president. <clears throat> the last time he ran for president was 1920. He was in prison, but while in prison, he got a million votes. President Wilson put him in prison, unjustly, I'll say, you know. President Harding, who came next, commuted his sentence, let him loose. The president has that power to commute a prisoner's sentence. All right. Um, here's one thing I want to point I want to make, folk. Then I want to do some reviewing. Jesse James would see a poor person and give money that he'd stolen from banks to the poor. Jesse James would have been better off, I mean, also would have been better off if he had robbed the poor and given that money to the rich. The richer the rich get, the richer we all get. The richer the ones who are. Supposing you have a man who has the money to do it, who decides, I want to build a supersonic jet that will fly to Europe, a 200 passenger supersonic jet. In order to build that thing, it's one thing that he has to hire engineers to draw it up, he has to hire experts to get the kinks and bugs out of it. And then, he has to hire workers to put it together. What if he doesn't have that kind of money, then he can't hire the workers, or what if, let's put it this way, what if nobody has that kind of money? We wind up living the way the American Indians lived. They had no social classes. They had no rich. They had no poor. They had no poor. They were all, to, by my standards, they were all poor. But they had no rich. They had no airplanes, no railroads, no radios, no computers, no telephones, no telegraphs. They were living on the same land we're living. They had none of that. And if they were left alone, they'd still have none of it today. They'd be living the same way their ancestors did. In order to have these things, folk, all right, this brings us up to the top of your papers. Some of the questions I'm asking on your papers that's going to be due next month involve this very thing. In order for a society to go from being primitive to having cars, roads, railroads, planes and trains, and even spaceships. You have to have your rich. All right, I'm a space enthusiast. I don't like to, I mean, I don't talk about it much, but when I was nine years old, our teacher would talk about going to the moon, and it was, while I was in her class, we shot our first rocket to the moon. The rocket missed. We were not as good at, as of aiming it as we are today. The rocket missed the moon, but at least the attempt was made. But this is 1958, 1959 actually. All right, I have had dreams of going on a space shuttle flight. I've had dreams of being on my way to Mars. I've had dreams of landing on another planet. At first, our space program was run by the government. And my books I read on kids said, only governments have the money to do it. Only the government can do it. Today, our space program is about to get off the ground. How? 
with private money. Now, some of you might be aware, we have men and women going to the space station today. Anybody know how they're getting there? They're using Russian ships. We have to pay the Russians, I believe, $20 million just for every one man and woman we send to the space station. And the Russians can use that money and hire better engineers and buy better equipment, better machinery, and put ahead of us. That money is coming from our tax dollars and going into this. This is, I mean, for this, this is for real. Our space shuttle was retired. Well, we now have, here's the good news, private firms are building some like this. And the SpaceX just last week, within a week, went to the space station unmanned, unloaded a bunch of its goods off the space station, loaded up a bunch of other goods, and splashed down just yesterday. Any of you hear about it? One of you did, a couple of you said, yeah. All right, it's being done, folk, with private money. Well, what's so great about private money? A private individual can decide, I want to go to Mars. If he has the money, we can go. What about the government? Well, the government's got to go through this bureaucrat and that bureaucrat and that bureaucrat. And President Johnson, right after he went to the moon, he said, bluntly, we're not going to Mars. And guess what? We haven't been there yet, except for robots. Point I'm trying to make, if I can, folk, is private initiatives and private industry can do what the government can't. Because there's too much red tape and too much bureaucracy and too much other places that government money has to go. All right. SpaceX was going to send a private individual into space, a passenger. If you, you can go, if you can pay $20 million, Guess what? There are men who can afford that. But there is a move on right now in one of our major parties. One person who's going to run for president on a ticket of, we're going to take every person who has more than a certain amount of money and take that money from them and redistribute that money among the poor. It's going to impoverish all of us. All right. The only way we can stay above every one of us being in poverty is for, to allow the rich among us to forge ahead and become richer. The richer the rich get, the richer we all get. Let them forge ahead. Now, I'll tell you about the South American crab. That if you put one of them in a barrel, he'll, he'll crawl out. But the natives put several of them in a barrel, and they keep each other from crawling out. They don't even put a lid on it. When one crab starts to get out, the rest of them will pull him down. That's what socialism does. Don't let your better men form, forge ahead. Now, <coughs> here is what upset that woman this morning, was the subject of health care. I have two daughters who are over 26. That means that they lost their health care coverage. One of them just turned 26 last month. She's laid off cannot afford health, she has no coverage. My other one, my oldest daughter, does have coverage, yes. Catch this close, it has a $15,000 deductible. Do you call that coverage, folk? But officially she's covered. That means that she has to spend $15,000 on medical costs before the insurance kicks in. She does not even like to go to a doctor. She doesn't even like to go to a pharmacy. The medicines I paid two, I paid five dollars for would cost her two hundred bucks. And I had a girl sitting in a class about where you're sitting. She said, "You mean you're saying the old medicine that we had before was better than what's here now?" I had to say, "Yes, it was." She said, "But some people were left out." All right, I want to tell you a, story, a couple of stories. Just recently. Not too long ago, a couple of our ships in the Far East were hit. They would have gone down, except the captain closed off the doors to the part of the ship where it was damaged. There were some men inside those door crewmen. They died. If the captain had not closed the doors, a whole ship would have gone down. Do you follow my logic, folk? The captain had to make a terrible decision. Let the men in that section 
due to no problem of their own, die so that the rest of the crew could be saved. Socialism lets the whole ship sink. Yes, capitalism leaves some people out. Socialism, in the long run, leaves everybody out. Now, there's a, this is a horror story. So this actually happened in World War II. We were listening in. We broke the Germans' code. We could listen to their coded messages. We knew what they were going to do. And well, it helped us win the war. Germany and Japan both did not change their code the entire war. And we broke their codes and listened in on our radio talk, even on our telephone talk. One day we learned that the Germans planned to bomb a certain British city. The leaders of Britain had to make a decision. Did they warn the people of that city? If they'd have warned them and the people would have left, lives would have been saved, but the Germans would have gone, hey, they're in on our code, we've got to change our code. The British government did not warn the people of that city. The city was bombed and a bunch of people in the city died. Years later, due to laws that were passed, 50 years went by and the British government released the documents and the people, you mean you let my daddy die when you could have warned him? Folk, this is awful, this is war, but this is the way it has to be fought. And if you don't like what I just said, I got something to tell you. I don't like what I'm saying either. The fact is, I outright hate it. But I feel very, if you might tell, I hope you could, I feel very strongly about what I'm saying. Under socialism, we all go down in a pile. Now, one person asked a question in this morning's class. I mean, they take, I mean, I'll say that they take more part than you do. I mean, that's just simply a fact. They, they're more, I mean, I, I think for a lot of you listening, or people listening, but, and a lot of you are nodding your head, I, I think I've got your attention. But they take, they'll be more effort to speak. But one person said, well, what can we do to make sure there are no poor? All right, I had to quote. I said, I don't like to do that. I know this is a state school, but I had to quote the Bible. There's a certain person the Bible said, you're going to always have the poor. His name was Jesus Christ. He actually said, the poor you will always have. Well, this was quoted when the socialist movement started in 1880. Somebody said, oh, but Jesus said all before the socialist slammed it down and said, that's... We don't live by that anymore. We're, we know better than that. We can end all poverty. All right, 139 years have gone by since they said that. This is almost 2020, this is 2019. 139 years. There are still poor among us. There were poor when I was growing up and I was one of them. There were poor in my dad's day. There were poor in my granddad's day. There were poor in my great grand. There's always been poor and folk. There always will be. Some cases it's due to their own bad judgments. In some cases it's due to sickness or something they can't help. And in some cases it's just due to they're simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. Like those men on those ships just happened to be at the wrong... I mean, maybe they were where they were assigned. But they happened to be in an unfortunate position. And they had to perish so the rest of the crew could be saved. All right. Again, I'll pause. Anybody have any comments? All right, I said I spend the rest of the time reviewing. I have 25 minutes. All right, I want to say this about the test. Uh, okay, now, for instance, the format. Now, it's fairly straightforward and simple. Supposing, now, now you see on the test. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you will see this and some of you won't. Now, folk, let me tell you, this is not a girl's name now. But, all right, what is, if you see that, how would you answer it? It's barbed wire. It's barbed wire. What is barbed wire? It's a type of wire that has sharp points placed strategically. In the old days, it was an inch apart. Now they put it about three inches apart, two and a half, three inches apart. But at one time, every barb was an inch apart. And it is designed to keep animals either fenced in or fenced out. And in a lot of cases, designed to keep humans fenced in and fenced out. Now, when the army uses barbed wire, you know, your gloves, you have to wear hand happy, are an inch thick. And the barbs are three edges, and they're razor sharp. I don't know I was in the army once. And they're putting these barbed wire fences across the Mexican-United States border 
whether you like it or not. But anyway, barbed wire. Um, all right, another question that some of you might see. Um, why did Britain and France decide not to help the Confederacy? Anybody know that? No, this is not just, this is not quite like this one. This is that there was a reason. I'm going to read it. Why did Great Britain and France decide we can't help the Confederacy? Anybody know? They were using slaves in a war. Not so much they were using slaves in a war. Yeah, that's true. But it's because they had slavery. And uh, Britain and France had both outlawed slavery in the early 18, well, two generations before. France in the late 1700s, Britain in the early 1800s, both outlawed slavery. And they said, our people will not let us support a war to support a slave nation. And this war, Abraham Lincoln made it a slave war. And the South was fighting to keep slavery. And they said, we cannot support a side that's fighting to keep slavery. So basically, if the answer on one is, they could not support, because of the issue of slavery, the South was fighting to keep slavery, and the North was fighting against it, and Britain and France could not help the South for that reason. Um, slavery was the issue. All right. Um, Oh yeah, here's one of the fool you. It fooled the class this morning. This word, now. Be careful with this one. What it doesn't mean. All right, what do you think it means? Yes? Take the president to trial. Have to bring charges to the government. Thank you, thank you. Now if you say it means to turn a president out of office, I have to count off a point for that. Impeach means you bring the charges. Yeah, we've had two presidents that were impeached, and Nixon was not one of them. Um, but in other words, it means to bring charges. And any president knows as long as he has 34 senators he can count on to vote for him, he's not going to be removed from office. When Nixon realized he only had 10 to 15 senators, 15 at very most, he resigned. The House was overwhelmingly going to vote to impeach in the Senate. He might have gotten 10 or 15 votes in the Senate, but that was all. So rather than go through it, he resigned. But he was never impeached. All right. Um, Appomattox. Why do we remember it? Why is it important? I mean, it's part of chapter 15. Yes? Uh, it was where the Civil War ended. The Civil War, for all practical purposes, ended there. For all practical purposes. That's a good answer. I don't count it. In actuality, there was a battle or two fought, and some of the other generals surrendered later. But Lee surrendered, and his troops all went home. The Union Army did not pursue the Confederates anymore. But there were some fights that went on out west. And some generals surrendered after Lincoln had died. But for all practical purposes, the war was over at Appomattox. Jefferson Davis tried to flee back to Birmingham to resume the war, but he was captured at a place in southern Georgia. If you go down toward Florida, if you go down I-75, you'll see a sign that says Jefferson Davis Capture Site. But uh, the war was over at Appomattox, at least for all practical purposes. Um, oh yeah. Now, there are two Douglases, Frederick Douglas and, um, let's see, I, I've gotten myself lost here. Uh, there was uh, the black man named Douglas. And then there was Lincoln's friend, Douglas. And I found myself all of a sudden having, oh, Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas and Frederick Douglas was the black man. Stephen Douglas was Lincoln's friend whom he opposed though in the election of 1858. Uh, but they're two different ones, so don't get them mixed up. Frederick Douglas, the black man who worked in slavery, who was, once, who was a runaway slave himself. And then Stephen Douglas, who was an Illinois man, who ran against Lincoln? The, uh, What's that? Frederick Douglass. As for, for 
uh, Lincoln's friend, uh, Stephen Douglas, he, they, they did, neither Lincoln nor Stephen had extreme views on slavery. They were willing to let it stay if it wanted to. See, Frederick Douglass, I mean, Stephen Douglas advocated what's called popular sovereignty. Now let each territory decide for itself. Neither one had strong views on it. Lincoln, though, was a little bit stronger. He said, let's contain it where it is. Let's not let it expand. Uh, so uh, they battled it out, and uh, eventually neither side really won. Lincoln wound up converting to the idea of, in order to win this war, I've got to make it a slave war and call for the end of slavery. He did not do that at first, but circumstances forced him. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, yes. Some Indians, some Indian names that some of you see for names like Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, and uh, any, any name you see like that, Rain in the Face. If you see those, I'll you know, just put down these were Indian chiefs. That's all I need. Indian chiefs. They were Western Indians, all three of them, who opposed the encroachment of white man on what had been their lands. And yes, I've got to say morally, they were fighting on high ground, but the other side of it, the fighting was suicide. They had no chance to win. But these Indians fought hard and fought long and realized after a while there was, there was no point in fighting anymore. Their fighting was hopeless. They were hopelessly outnumbered. You can feel sorry for them. Yes. Um, all right. Who was the first Republican ever put up as to be president of the United States? He did not win, but who was the candidate the Republican Party put up first time? The first time they ran a candidate. The Republicans put up a man named John C. Fremont. Fremont. Yeah, he was a northerner and he was anti-slave. He did not win. Of course, he had problems with his personal management of his affair. I mean, was, put it this way, um, he had problems with mismanagement. Yes? We have to list the full name or we can just give Just the name Fremont. Well, actually, what you'll probably see is Fremont. I'll have his the full name down. And then you put down, you can put down he was the pathfinder or he ran for president on the Republican ticket, first Republican candidate, either answer will do or both answers. Uh, that's the way you'll see him on the test. Now, yes? Can you get extra points if you put like more facts? No, it's going to still be three points apiece. I know what you're saying, but I don't really have a provision for that. Okay, it depends on, I mean, you know, each of the, like for instance, Frederick Douglass, you can easily write a 300-page book about him. I mean, you really can. Put down how he met William Lord Garrison one time, and you know, and they discussed freeing the slaves, and uh, he met with Abraham Lincoln while Lincoln was in the White House. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. I mean, you can, and as, again, about Abraham Lincoln, you could write a thousand pages about him. Robert E. Lee, there have been more than a thousand pages written about him too, um, and I. <clears throat> three points. That's all. Three points apiece. That will give you more, possibly more than 100 points. Um, now, <clears throat> who was Dred Scott? He was a. Anybody know? Somebody was saying something. Yes. He was the lawyer that got um, taken onto the ship and then uh, watched the ramparts, right? You're talking about a different case entirely. Dred Scott was, yes. He was involved in the Dred Scott decision. He was involved in the Dred Scott decision. He had lived, his, he was a slave. His master had carried him to Minnesota, which was then a territory, but a, a territory that outlawed slavery. Then his master carried him to Illinois. And he resided both in Minnesota and Illinois. And he said that he should be free because he had lived in a territory and a state where the slavery was illegal. Therefore, he should be free. The Supreme Court ruled otherwise. 
and basically said that slavery was the law of the land. It had to be respected everywhere because if it was respected in one state, it was to be the law in every state. And the com basically it rendered the compromise impossible. I don't believe Henry Clay could have gotten us out of the mess that it created if Henry Clay had been alive. Because several men tried compromising after that and none of them got anywhere. Compromise was all but impossible. Dred Scott, um, 